am Tim. I'm Karen. I'm Bob. And we're back in the field once again with 007 as we discuss From Russia With Love from 1964. James Bond, that notorious, amazing Dr. No secret agent is back. And half the world is out to kill him. As he fits his murderous talents against the Iron Curtain and its velvet women. Well, I'll tell you something, Coltoni. You're one of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. I think my mouth is too big. No, it's the right size. For me, that is. From Russia with love. They dance for him. They yearn for him. They die for him. From Zagreb to Sofia. From Venice to Istanbul. From Paris to London. Agent 007 cuts an inimitable path through the palaces and boudoirs of espionage. Following the defeat of Dr. No, the criminal organization Spectre plots revenge against British agent James Bond. Criminal mastermind Blofeld devises a trap for the gentleman spy with some very tempting bait. Beautiful Soviet defector Tatiana Romanova, who promises to help the British government secure the Lecter, a Russian decoding device. Bond, unable to pass up the chance to gain such a strategic advantage against Russia, agrees to meet Romanova and smuggle the device back to England. Unaware that Spectre assassin Grant is trailing their every move, waiting for his moment to disgrace Bond, kill the both of them, and steal the Lecter for his employer's insidious plans. As usual, we'll be discussing From Russia with Love in detail, so if you haven't seen the movie and wish to remain unspoiled, we recommend watching the film before listening to the rest of this episode. The movie was released by United Artists on May 27, 1964 in the U.S. and October 11, 1963 in the U.K. Shot for a budget of $2 million, it made $78.9 million worldwide with $24 million in the U.S. It actually had a pretty mild opening when it first came out, but it was a bigger success in America after it was paired with Goldfinger on a double feature. It won the BAFTA Award for Best Cinematography and was nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Song and, of course, is based on the novel by Ian Fleming. So, what was everybody's thoughts on From Russia With Love? I still hate Bond. <laughs> <laughs> Succinct. Very good. Yeah. Ah, you know, it's not my favorite James Bond movie, but it's a decent one. It's unusual, you know, because it's not quite deep enough to work as a realistic spy movie and it's not quite Bondy enough to be a Bond movie. I, I feel like the best way to watch this one is like in between two other Bond movies. Okay, that one was really action Okay, now here's what you just saw, but if they sucked out all the really, really weird stuff and it's just, you know, some mild action and Sean Connery making sexist double entendres right down to just the, the back and forth stuff. And ordering fish and checking into hotel rooms. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There were so, like, just wide gaps of nothing. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more, like, story information in this one than a lot of the others. The others have a lot more incident. Yes, we, we got the dramatic ordering of the soul. Mm. <laughs> hey, the film's got to have soul. I would like the soul. With the red or the white candy, the red candy. Dun, dun, dun. I should have known red Chianti with fish. Well, red anything with fish. Is, <laughs> is, is, like, that's, you can tell that they hadn't quite figured out what the James Bond movie was yet. You know, because in a lot of ways, this and Dr. No both feel like more conventional, realistic, in quotations, noir spy movies. Mm. Like there's still a little bit of like pick up on South Street and stuff in there. It's just a little bit more cartoony. So it's they've got the OK, it moves faster and everyone is much more archly drawn and, you know, for lack of a better word, caricatured than in a realistic spy movie. But they hadn't quite leaned in on okay so he can't just have a nice suitcase it has to be a crazy suitcase like a knife in the shoe is just not gonna cut it you know for later on like the the action hadn't become as broad as the characters yet which is actually one of the reasons why i really like this one mm. i actually say this is my favorite of the connery ones for that mm. very reason that mm. this is before it gets locked into the formula and it's funny because dr no you can already see the formula taking shape here's mm. the evil bad guy here's his base here's this you know mild action scene and I like that this one breaks free of that. Bond doesn't show up for like 20 minutes. He doesn't actually face what seems to be the main bad guy until about 80 minutes into the movie. Mm. And then it turns out that's not totally the main bad guy. There's no evil secret base. They're running around all over the countryside instead. It does feel a lot more like an actual spy thing. The stakes aren't world domination or yeah. destroying rockets just for the sake of destroying rockets like in the last one. There's an actual concrete plan that you could see a spy agency trying to do, trying to gain a strategic advantage by getting this device. That does make it feel a little bit more like an actual spy movie. Mm. It still has tons and tons of problems, as we'll get into. I, <laughs> it's one of those ones where I forgot how much offensive stuff is in this movie until watching it again. Like, oh, oh, God, that. Oh, man, that's terrible. Much of which you could actually just cut out of the movie and it wouldn't change the plot at all. Mm. At but, this point, if that's not part of the entertainment value, you just can't watch. Like, if if you can't be entertained by, you know, that even like on some like detached level, 
you know, you're just not going to enjoy these because it's so much of it. Uh, I don't know. It's just, it's so blatant sometimes it just really makes you cringe though. Oh yeah. Oh no. It's, it's, it's cringy. You know, it, they're cultural artifacts because it's, it's not like this is stuff that's there. It's like, oh man, why'd they put that in the movie? No, they made the movie so that that could be well, in there. Not just the sexism stuff though, but the racism. Yep. And in this one, it's a little more subtle, but the homophobia, which is in a lot of these early ones. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff is just, uh, yeah, turns it's, me off. Uh, it's a rough watch. Yeah. Well, at this point, you had Sean Connery kind of settling in as James Bond. He's, mm. He seems to be getting into the role a little bit more. He's a little more laid back. But watching these again, it is tougher to take Connery as Bond than it used to be for me. I don't mm. know. He just seems to be reading the lines. There's no real emotion. He goes from zero to pushing somebody up against a wall without any real transitions. Mm. But most of the time, he's just kind of, he's the cool James Bond, where it's just like, hand me my shirt. <laughs> Like, <laughs> he can do the smug self-amusement thing. That's, That's one of the prime things he brings yeah. to the part. Yeah. Yeah, like when uh, midway through the movie when his ally is murdered and he's suddenly angry and throwing Tatiana around. It's like, you, you don't totally buy it. Not mm. at all. It seemed like an act. Especially if we'd learned that was James Bond acting like he was mad, I would have bought that. Now, it doesn't help that a minute before you see him talking to that guy's son and he's just kind of like, oh, great. Here's the stuff. Bye. Well, I, uh, I have some, some bad news. Your father's dead. Who did it? Tell me. Well, he took care of that himself. The other man died first. Now listen. I'll need some help to get across the frontier strip between Yugoslavia and Trieste. I want you to send a message to M in London. Tell him to send someone from Station Y to meet me in Zagreb, all right? I will. Good. Oh, you'll, uh, I think you want these. No sense of, sorry about your, your father or anything like that. I actually grew to like him. He was cool. Just like, all right, I'm going to go now. Bye. See you later. Mm. And I know that's kind of the appeal in some ways of the Craig one, that he is this cold-blooded bastard, almost more of an anti-hero at that point. But at this point, we're still supposed to really be cheering for him, so it doesn't totally work. Well, he's still a self-insert character at this point. That's why Connery is best at the self-satisfied smug thing, because like the movies are still pretty much right up until Dalton came on. You know, that was the, the whole thing was always, you want to be this guy, right? You want to go to all these cool places? You want to fuck these cool women? You want to you you, you be this guy, right? You want to look good doing it? And whether or not they should be, that's most of what is being marketed here is that that's why most of this even when it's no action it's like look checking into hotels travel isn't this yeah. novel look at all these places you'll never go you'll know being, which caviar to eat yeah, yeah right yeah. being a spy you just get given women it kind of goes to that post-world war ii when the citizens of britain didn't have much they were coming off of rationing they were used yeah. to not having any real food or anything so yeah this fantasy of you can you know have stay in the best hotels drive all the nice cars eat mm. all this incredible food there is definitely part of that. One thing I do like about this one that kind of disappears as we get into the series is this is one of the few where Bond is kind of behind the plot the whole time. He kind of suspects that it's a trap and something's going to happen, but yeah. he's manipulated the way that Kronstein, the big evil planner for Spectre, wants him to be for so much of it. And I like that. So much of the later ones, it's uh, Bond immediately suspects, oh, this guy's obviously a mole, mm. this one's a traitor, or something like that. And it's nice to see him not ahead of the game for once in one of these. Mm. So when Grant is actually kind of throwing it in his face that, ha, we manipulate you the whole time, you're kind of like, oh, yeah, you did. Good job. <laughs> yeah. There were Good no view. real consequences for him, though. The one main character who got murdered, he didn't seem to care at all. I think we're supposed to take it that he did, but it just doesn't come across yeah. the way Connery plays so it. So there are no consequences to his ignorance. <laughs> Pretty much every time Connery doesn't have like the shit-eating grin, where I think we're supposed to take that as, oh, okay, now it's personal. Oh, now, he's so now sad. The, look yeah. at the deep emotion on that face. <laughs> <laughs> now that now the stakes are up. Which could be him going, hmm, maybe I should order the eggs. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was fish with red wine. And it's funny because in the original book, this is the one that Fleming was very close to killing Bond. And the end of the book implies that Bond gets killed. And that fight with Rosa Klebb, he actually gets stabbed. And the last scene is him passing out and we assume dying. And that's the end of it. And then right. Fleming changed his mind and brought him back. He did a Sherlock Holmes. Pretty much, yeah. So there, there would have been a consequence to him not getting it the entire time. Right. that he finally gets killed. One of the big saving graces of this movie for me, and even though he doesn't do much for the first half of the movie, is Robert Shaw's Grant. He is such a great bad yeah. guy. It's amazing when you think about it, he doesn't speak for like 80 minutes of the movie. Mm. He doesn't say anything. He and glowers. He glowers. He walks yeah. around and glowers. And stalks. He stalks very well. Although the whole time I couldn't help but hear his Quint voice in my head. Yeah. <laughs> Man goes in the train compartment. Train compartment goes in the tunnel. Man comes out of the tunnel. I couldn't help it. <laughs> 
But that scene where he Bond finally finds out what's going on, and Grant is pretty much boasting about it and telling him what he's going to do to him. My orders are to kill you and deliver the lector. Oh, I do. It's my business. It'll be slow and painful. The first one won't kill you. Not the second. Not even the third. Not till you crawl over here and you kiss my foot. That's where the movie really clicks for me. That's such a good scene. Mm. It takes a while to get there. It does take a while to get there, but you're also kind of waiting for it. I mean, you see him stalking Bond in the background for so much of this movie, you're just waiting for this big confrontation to finally happen. Mm. Uh, As for the female lead, Daniela Bianchi as Tatiana Romanova, it's one of those unfortunate things that so many of the female leads in these early ones are dubbed over. In this case, um, she was Italian and had a really thick accent and tried to do the English. She learned her part phonetically, but it just wasn't close enough. So they actually had her dubbed over by Barbara Jefford. And whenever they do it in these movies, it never quite works. The voice just doesn't look like it's coming from her. No, no. But I do like her performance anyway, the physical performance of it. That scene where she's in the room alone and she's kind of making faces, like pretending she has a mustache, looking yeah. in the mirror. Mm. You get the sense that, yes, she's a spy in this organization, but she's also kind of still a child, kind of a bit of a kid to her. Mm. Yeah, I had trouble believing her as a spy because she was just so deeply naive. Well, part of it is that she's not really a field agent so much as yeah. kind of an office worker, which I think is one of the reasons why she's chosen. She's pretty. She doesn't have the experience to know what she's getting into. And she's emotionally a mess. She's fragile. She, mm. She'd had, I think they said, three lovers, and she was in love with them, so she wears her heart on her sleeve. And then you have had the three lovers. What is the purpose of such an intimate question? You are not here to ask questions. You forget to whom you're speaking. I was in love. And if you were not in love? I suppose it would depend on the man. Sensible answer. This man, for instance. I cannot tell. Perhaps if he was kind and kulturny. She's going to get involved with Bond, and it's going to be a real involvement for her, even if she doesn't like him, because she's being told, hey, go do this thing. She's going to form an attachment, and she does in a way that is so disturbing. Don't leave me, don't leave me, like over and over. It's so sad. When I first saw this, I couldn't tell for the longest time when she's being all kind of coquettish toward him and, you know, oh, well, we always make love the same way in England. I wasn't sure, is this part of the act? Oh, yet? no, you that know? was her. Yeah. That was all her. That's one of my problems that we never see that transition point where she's mm. supposed to actually fall for him because so much of it I feel like, oh, okay, she's still on the act. She's still a loyal yeah. Russian agent. And I just can't buy it. There's nothing that happens that makes me think, oh, she's actually falling for No, I mean, the the only hint we have is that she is emotionally fragile. We're given to believe that she will attach herself to any man because this is her thing. And that's what she's being used for. Her, Her agency is absolutely abusing her in this situation. They know going into it she's really she's gonna sell the performance because for her it's real Mm. well that's part of my problem is that in the book it is actually smirsh the russian agency that's doing this since they change it to specter in the movie part of the thing in the book is that she starts to realize oh my agency's doing this horrible stuff and really wants to defect and that doesn't really come across here especially Mm. when you realize the russians are just kind of doing their thing they're not really evil in the old-fashioned sense here So there's no real sense of why she'd want to defect. I mean, she's still on mission for so much of the movie. Mm. Again, that point is blurry where that that change happens. Well, and the genre in general hadn't quite dived over into the point where, like, the jaded, cynical Ice Queen thing was supposed to be sexy in itself. Like, they hadn't discovered that trope just, or at least it hadn't come back into fashion. Yeah. One other thing in terms of Tatiana shooting club... I know it's not the case, but I really like to believe it's because she realized she got deceived by her and that she's actually a Spectre agent, not that she's doing it just to save Bond. It doesn't really work because you can see that moment of indecision on her face. Where we she's can like, wish for it, but yeah. it's not true. I'd really prefer to read it that way, but at least it gives her a little bit more agency. Mm. One of the more fun characters, though, is Pedro Armandares' Ali Karimbe, who is at least colorful. There's that scene where he's discussing his background, that he employs all of his sons as his close help because he can trust them, and that he used to be like a carnival strongman, which I, yeah. I thought sounded like some kind of Werner Herzog character. That, oh, yeah. you're a spy. What'd you do before you were a spy? That kind of bizarro person you'd expect mm-hmm. him right, his. Yeah. Coffee. Medium sweet. Two, medium sweet. He also is my son. All of my key employees are my sons. Blood is the best security in this business. You must have quite an establishment here. 
Biggest family payroll in Turkey. Not bad for a man who started life breaking chains and bending bars with his teeth in a circus. And he's a lot of fun. He's a lot more interesting than most of the other characters. Mm. Unfortunately, his introduction also exposes the audience to the horrendous gypsy scene. Oh. And they do say gypsy. Yeah. <laughs> so That's unfortunate. Yes, it is very unfortunate. And this sense of he actually says that he's been using them against the Russians the way they've been using, I think it's the Bulgars, which is also a kind of a creepy yes. idea. In a way, it's interesting because it's that sense of, oh, he's this charming, jovial guy, but also this really cold-blooded, ruthless guy who will use anybody to further his country's ends. Mm -hmm. which including his own children. Including his own children and putting them into risk, as we see. Yep. Armand Dar has been in a lot of John Ford movies like The Fugitive, Ford Apache, Three Godfathers. Unfortunately, one of the ones he appeared in before this was The Conqueror. And due to them shooting that movie near nuclear test areas where so much of the cast was sick, he was really sick with cancer at this point. And if you watch in the movie, you can see a lot of scenes he's limping because it was in his hip and he was pretty much near the end. He only mm. did this movie because he wanted some extra money to leave to his family. Aww. And a lot of scenes, it's actually not him. It's Terrence Young, the director, or another stand-in for him. A lot of the Romana Camp scenes, that's actually not him in the background of those shots. His son would actually appear in the series later in License to Kill, which is, I think, the only time that that's happened. A father and son both appear in these. Mm. But his death is one of the few things I think that actually kind of has a bit of weight to it, especially because we don't see it. That great scene where he's sitting down with this spy they've tied up. Let me tell you my life story. You'll love it. And the next thing we see of him is him dead on the floor. It's kind of a shock. You know, he's a lot of fun. This is still when there was always, like, they don't they do not do these in the, the Craig ones. They really didn't do it in the, uh, unless they made it one of the Bond girls. They didn't for Brosnan either. Bond really can't be anything because he has to just be a slate for the audience. So we have to give him another guy who's in the movie who's really colorful and interesting to hang out on. Sometimes it's Felix. Mm -hmm. You know, the, in this time, it's this guy. This is one of the things I miss about the modern Bond movies. There's so much more, like, ensemble pieces back then. It's like, you know, James Bond is the guy who goes through all the movies, but there's always this whole big thing going on around him, and now it's it's much more like, hey, he's this one singular superhero guy, and he's off, he's gonna fight the one bad guy, get the one girl. It's it's all so small now. Yeah, he'd have these cool allies who have their own thing going on, like right. um, Tracy's father from Honor Majesty's Secret Service, the yeah, kind of boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of the travelogue the appeal of these was we're gonna go all over the world you're gonna see all of these wild places you only ever seen in postcards through green screen but you know hey we're there we're kind of there look it's a pyramid and we're gonna see all these colorful interesting gregarious characters and connery's gonna sit there and eat something you can't pronounce you know just just go with it man all of this was followed through with the indiana jones series yeah it was yeah. the same format we're gonna go somewhere exotic and non-western we're gonna see them trying food that they've never eaten wear clothing that we aren't used to seeing, and there are some colorful characters around the edges. And that's something this movie, I think, gets really right. All the scenes shot in Istanbul, they do a good job of putting you into that environment. Mm. I think a lot better than they did with Jamaica in the last movie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The architecture, him going through all the marketplaces, all these great weird side streets, that stuff I think looks great. Mm. How much of that was filmed in studio, or was all of it? A lot of it was on location. All the interiors are in studio for the okay. most part. Going back to the bad guys, I think it's interesting that you have Grant, who seems like the primary villain, but he's actually really a lackey, which... Mm. It kind of makes you wonder, all right, who would you consider the real villain of this? I mean, there's Blofeld, but he doesn't really actually do anything other than sit behind his desk with his cat. So, Lada Lenya as Rosa Klebb, I almost consider her the real bad guy of the movie. More or less, yeah. She is the one who's actually putting the plan into action, is supervising all of this, mm. and running things from behind the scenes. Which makes it interesting when you consider it's not Bond who kills the villain, but the Bond girl. Yeah. She's the one who stops her from shooting him, and then she's the one who actually shoots her in the end. I kind of think of this movie as that intermediate level, like you think you've beaten the boss, but the boss level is still ahead of mm. you. So she's a stepping stone to the bigger bad, but she is the big bad of this film. Yeah. yeah. I, so we don't actually meet the bad, bad guy. And she's under orders. She's under threat yeah. to carry this mission forward. So in a way, she's not his biggest threat because they would find somebody else. Mm. They would eventually, but certainly for this story, she is. And we yeah. get the sense she's the one who's organizing the helicopter that's chasing after him and the boat chase that comes after her, which all of which comes after they've taken care of Robert Shaw. So mm -hmm. again, 
for a big bad guy, there's a lot of stuff that happens after he's out of the movie. Well, Spectre is yeah. Spectre the in bad general guy. is the big bad guy. In the next one with them, Thunderball, it's it's much more Blofeld's in the background, but here's your main villain in that right. one with Emilio mm. Largo, and he has henchmen, and he's the bad guy who has to be dealt with. They yeah. haven't quite gotten into that format yet. Yeah. Well, and Cleb comes back in this one in the place where the sidekick usually comes back. Usually, you kill the main bad guy, and then you think it's okay, and then the henchman is in the hotel room. Right. Yeah. yeah. Although it, it makes sense because it's like she doesn't seem as much of a physical threat mm. as, as the main guy. So it's a, it's a different spin on things a little yeah. bit. Yeah, they have like the trio of them. You have Kronstein, who's the brains. Yeah. Uh, Grant is the muscle, and she's sort of middle management. Yeah. As for Lenya herself, uh, she actually earned an Oscar nomination for The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone and was married to Kurt Vile. The other thing about her character that's unfortunate and... I'll give Lenya credit for how she layers it in there subtly, but it's still unpleasant, is the stereotypical evil lesbian thing, Mm -hmm. which you can see in a little ways when she first gets to the uh, Spectre training ground and Morzeni, the henchman, puts a hand on her arm to lead her and she just yanks it away like, ugh. Mm. At first I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. But then when you see her with Romanova and how she's all over her and putting her hand on her knee and stuff, it's just like, oh, don't do that. I, I hate that trope. Your work record is excellent. The state is proud of you. Thank you, Comrade Colonel. Take off your jacket. Turn around. Hmm. You're a fine-looking girl. Have you ever listened to the old Criterion commentary for this movie? All the guys are like, oh, isn't that great? It's in, we thought it would be so funny. It's all in good taste. It's like, oh, fuck <laughs> you. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is, I can't watch her and not think of the Frau Farbesina character from the Austin I Powers know. movies, because that's they, exactly where yeah, that they, came from they, in this, this movie. They nailed that one. <laughs> this is the first time I've seen this film, and of course I've seen Austin Powers, and, I, and it was part of my early adulthood film watching. So every time I saw it, I was like, oh, okay, alarm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's her. <laughs> <laughs> this is also the first time we get Q in the movies. Yes. Because Peter Burton, the guy who played the Q branch guy in the last movie, decided he didn't want to come back for this one. So Desmond Llewellyn stepped in and made a, pretty much a whole career out of it. Yeah. And unfortunately, we haven't gotten to the point where he's sniping at Bond, which is the part mm. I really love. Pay attention. But put that down. Pay attention <laughs> over here. Here he's just kind of the standard technician guy. Got it? Good? Okay. An ordinary tin of talcum powder inside a tear gas cartridge. That goes in the case against the side here like that. Now, normally to open a case like that, you move the catches to the side. If you do, the cartridge will explode in your face. Now, to stop the cartridge exploding, turn the catches horizontally, like that. Then open normally. You got it? Yes, I think so. Well, he sort of absorbs the being just having no time for Bond (laughs) that everyone else at this point already... like. They kind of stop that after Thunderball, right? Because like Bond is like very respectable after this point. When at least in the Connery ones, heading into the more ones and into the Lazy Me one, you know, is that everyone's just kind of like, oh yes, Commander Bond. You know, this is this you know. Whereas everyone else in Doctor No, this one, Goldfinger, it's still there. M, Money Penny Q, everyone back at HQ. When we see them, they're all kind of sick of his shit. Whenever mm-hmm. we see them, I think the, M pretty much sticks to that for the most yeah. part. But well, they they turn them into old buddies as they go on. You know, it becomes like they little, have this yeah. whole history together and they're all back into that whereas in this one you can just see people it's like oh my god this fucking guy jesus <laughs> that scene where they're listening to his recording from romanova about the lector to confirm it and and you can just imagine m's just like oh god just <laughs> shut him up and all these other guys are kind of like yeah, no we we, we want to hear about this uh, tokyo mission <laughs> keep going yeah yeah and, of course, Lois Maxwell's Money Penny doesn't get as much to do here. Yeah. He doesn't really seem to be kind of throwing it back at him quite as much. But The flirting is more over the top than in the last film. And if I hadn't had the last film to go on, I would have said that she's just a typical, oh, James mm, kind yeah. of person. But it, building from the first movie where she was really just giving him everything he gave her... I could see how this has just been an evolution of their workplace fake romance thing. The, the thing that will never happen between them, because neither of them really want it. I want plane ticket, lucky man. I've never been to Istanbul. You've never been to Istanbul? No. Where well, the moonlight on the Bosphorus is irresistible. Maybe I should get you to take me there someday. I've tried everything else. Darling money, Penny. You know I never even look at another woman. Oh, really, James? Mm-hmm. 
The only place it sort of comes in here is when Sylvia Trench is bugging him when he's on the phone and she's like, oh, that sounds like an interesting case. Yeah. <laughs> trying to push him back into that. Yeah. There's also the guy who plays Kronstein, Vladek Scheibal, I think, who has been in a bunch of Ken Russell movies like The Billion Dollar Brain and Women oh, in Love. Oh, yeah, that guy. And as well as Casino Royale, the spoof movie, The Apple, and Red Dawn. He's one of the Russian generals in that. And you still haven't <laughs> seen The Apple. I still haven't which, seen The uh, Apple. Which, oh, you just haven't seen The no, Apple? No, I've been oh, meaning my. to. Oh, wow. It's, it's on the list. It's one of the worst films I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It's canon's, It wants to be canon's Rocky Horror. It's fantastic. <laughs> But uh, I love his demeanor here. He comes across as sort of a really a taller, thinner Peter Lorre. That mm. very soft-spoken, the plan is perfect. It's perfect. He is very, very creepy. Mm. And that moment when he gets killed, assuming it was going to be Rosa Klebb who gets it, that sort of, but no, that's not right. Why me? <laughs> this is also the last time we'll see Eunice Gason as Sylvia Trench, Bond's sort of on-again, off-again girlfriend from the last movie. Thus setting up Bond never staying with the same girl for more than one movie. Yeah, and that that's it. That's pretty much the only time. Yep. Yeah, no, she's the yeoman rand of James Bond movies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> At least she's not breaking into his apartment this time. <laughs> and as Blofeld, they hadn't really cast him yet, so they had Anthony Dawson, the guy who played Professor Dent from the last movie, was the body, and Eric Pullman playing the voice. And it feels like they hadn't quite gotten Blofeld yet. He has that weird purring voice to him, but mm. every time they showed him talking, it's just the cat. All I can think of is that the head of Spectre <laughs> is a cat who's a ventriloquist. <laughs> yeah. Because the cat is watching the conversation. It looks like it's reacting as though the cat's speaking. Siamese fighting fish. Fascinating creatures. Brave, but on the whole, stupid. Yes, they're stupid. Except for the occasional one such as we have here, who lets the other two fight. While he waits. Waits until the survivor is so exhausted that he cannot defend himself. And then, like Spectre, he strikes. Knowing that this movie isn't smart enough to go there and just knowing that it's James Bond and it's not going to happen, it made me sad that that wasn't Sean Connery playing Blofeld Mm. because it sounds like him. It does. It sounds so much like Connery that I thought, oh, it's Bond and he's faking everybody out. I kept thinking it sounded like John Vernon, the guy who played Dean Warmer from Animal House, if he was trying Mm. to do some kind of bad Eastern European accent. Yeah. I didn't know if there's much to say about the direction other than, um, yeah, it's a movie. It happened. Terrence Young back after Dr. No, and he do one more Thunderball. This was supposedly his favorite of his three Bond movies. I will say this, he does better with the action scenes in this one than he mm. did in the last one. A lot of the physical fights in Dr. No just seemed really clumsy. I know they were trying some new radical editing things for it, but most of them don't work. The train fight here, though, is mm. really good. And his decision to have them knock out the light bulb the first thing, so it's almost all shot in the dark, yeah. just with those weird blue room lights on. That's a really great scene. It doesn't feel awkward and speed it up like a lot of the other action mm-hmm. scenes do. Anytime yeah. somebody gets punched, they like speed when the guy falls over to make it go faster. They get that, better at that as they go. They do definitely get yeah. better, but that fight scene is one of the best. Mm, yeah. I don't think they top it until possibly Goldeneye with the big climactic Sean Bean Pierce Brosnan fight, which is also really good. Yeah, for the hand to hand ones, that's right up there. Yeah, so disappointing that I have to wait until Goldeneye for another good fight scene. How many movies are in between that? There are, no, there are some other good fight scenes, just that's the next one that's this good. The other two big action scenes, the helicopter scene, which is a complete grab right out of North by Northwest, but yeah. yep. it's well filmed. I mean, you can see that pilot is really coming close to Connery in a couple of those swoops. I mean, yeah. it looks like there's only like three or four feet over his head, mm. and Connery is really ducking to basically stay alive. Yeah, I really Method like that acting. scene. Method acting. <laughs> Um, the other one is the big boat chase. It's a cool shot when the marine fuel ignites, but doesn't really work for me. I mean, it doesn't feel like there's enough time for that marine fuel to get everywhere and blow yeah. up all those boats. Yeah. It's a really cool action beat of just boom, <laughs> cut to all these boats smashing into each other and poor guys on fire falling off. It wasn't shot to the best benefit of the scene. Everything felt really slow. And in a motorboat chase scene, it's got to be fast. It did not look fast. It really didn't look like there was a lot of danger. They were firing off giant projectiles that mm. were missing by very wide margins. Well, they were trying to miss at that point because they were just trying to scare him into slowing down. Because you can hear the guy going, stop shooting so close. We don't want to blow up the lector. Oh. <laughs> but I do like that. Mr. Bond, you're trapped. The open ocean is right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just keep going. Uh, they didn't figure out boats until Thunderball. 
Yeah, well, I was thinking of the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade speedboat chase. And yeah, how that's great. A good, that scene is. That's a good boat chase. <laughs> I always forget how much train there is in this movie. <laughs> I like that part of it. It, it gives you mean me kind so of, many different trains. Yeah, the stock yeah. footage doesn't match up a lot of times. Mm. Now it's green. Now it's red. It gives me kind of this narrow margin vibe to it, though. There's always mm. something romantic, and it feels like that kind of throwback suspense idea of setting it on a train. Yeah. I like that. And again, it gives the plot movement. Also, when it comes to those confrontations and fight scenes, the fact that the fight scene is in this tiny little train cabin, yeah. and it's claustrophobic and they can mm. barely move when they're throwing each other around, I think really adds to it. And this idea that it's kind of hard for them to escape once the train's in motion. Because otherwise you'd be wondering, all right, why doesn't when they're in Istanbul, as soon as they get the lector, they put him, go to the airport, yeah. get on a private plane that Karen Bay charters and fly them to England, you know? Yeah. Is this the only spy movie like this that t- spends this much time on a train where no one gets up on top of the train? The Lady Vanishes turns out to be a spy movie in the end, and they never get on the train, so okay, that right. one counts. Right. We kind of went into it a bit, but the fact that they introduced Spectre into the story where it wasn't there originally yeah. does really change things, because you have that whole idea that Spectre is escalating the tensions between mm. MI6 and the Russians, and then you have that guy who's trying to kill um, Karen Bay for a lot of it, mm. and you have to think, well, he's kind of acting in response to the fact that they think that the British killed one of their Russian agents. Yeah. So when you're cheering on them shooting this guy, you kind of realize it was kind of this escalation that wasn't really their fault. Mm. It changes the tenor of, aha, let's cheer as they shoot the Russians. No, not really. It makes it a little more interesting, though, I think. The, the Spectre thing, it's only there so that it, it can be a, like a step removed from reality mm-hmm. in the first place. But otherwise, you do just have a bad Russians versus good MI6 guys thing. You know, For a lot of the movie, it feels almost like maybe how the Cold War really was at that point. It's just kind of like, yeah, we're just kind of at a game. We're just kind of gaming shit out. Every once in a while, someone has to get shot, but you know, whatever. And now these like Illuminati-type dudes come in and you know, have to ruin everyone's day for it. Yeah, that great scene where Karen Bay's son, the chauffeur, is talking about how, oh, it's this guy today following us. They tend to follow us, we tend to follow them. It's just how it works. I suppose it's customary to have people telling you in these parts. Oh, yes, sir. Today it's Citroen H31854 on duty. They're Bulgarians working for the Russians. They follow us, we follow them. It's a sort of understanding we have. It's very friendly. They have this nice little status quo setup, and Spectre ruins it. But they never really address the fact that they do all this violent stuff to these Russian agents, but it's not really their fault, Tony. No, no. Not to mention Bond blows up their embassy to get the lector. Yet this is not the first and won't be the last time that Bond causes way too much damage disproportionate to his mission. Well, but at least when he does this sort of thing in Casino Royale and partially blows up an embassy, M's pissed at him with good yeah. reason. Well, just wait till they get the bill. That's what I want to see. I want to see one of these where Bond has to go in and like invoice all of this shit. You know, because he's clearly spending money. He's buying all kinds of food. He always has nice new suits, mm-hmm. you know. And cars. By now, this is, what, 64, right? He knows to wrap it up, so he has to have reams and reams of of prophylactic just on him at all times because he doesn't seem like a stupid man. There's the scene I want at the end of the movie, M calling him into his office, $3,000 for what? (laughs) (laughs) Is this a euphemism? It's okay, um, I have receipts. This is one of those movies that I guess it went through a lot of censorship, especially in England and mm. essentially all over the world as a result. There's a ton of stuff that got cut out of this movie. Yeah. And it it's funny because it feels pretty mild looking at it now, but mm. there was a lot they had to lose. The scene where the Spectre guys are filming Bond and Tatiana having sex, apparently that went on a lot longer. And you see like the cameraman's <laughs> getting a little bit too into it and he's like sweating like, oh, wow. They had to get rid of that. That is a more self-consciously sleazy scene than you usually get yeah. in these. The, yeah. the, the, the Bond movies are usually very, at least editing-wise, quasi-romantic about the weaponized sexuality thing. And this one is just kind of like, by the way, just so you know, this really is a filthy business they're in. <laughs> Was using the film against him, being like, oh, well, if you don't do this, these will go public. It's like, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Is it the Great White Hike where, yeah. where they try to blackmail like the Don King type guy yeah. Yeah. And, and he laughs in their face because he's like, are you are you kidding me? Did they have no intel on James Bond? They're like, oh no, they're going to think I had sex at work. <laughs> oh God. He's like, going he's gonna to show this to his friends, invite them all over yeah. for some champagne. Watch this now. Oh God, uh, he is exactly that dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They had to cut out a lot of the dialogue, like a lot of their double entendre stuff. There's still some in there that I'm like, considering some of the stuff they had to cut, I'm like, they left that in? That's mm. kind of surprising. A lot of the Romani camp fight scene had to be cut down, supposedly because when the women are fighting, there was a shot where you can see pubic hair. So oh. the pudding wrestling was cut out. <laughs> <laughs> you could take that whole scene out. I mean... The entire scene at the camp didn't need to happen. Like, all right, the belly dancer, okay, fine. 
But it didn't need to happen at all. We didn't even need to be there. Well, I, it leads to the big action scene, so I'm okay with that. But like, cut it off at the belly dancer, and then a shot rings out, and you have the fight scene. Fine. The big action scene could have happened anywhere else, hotel, out at the market, anywhere. But they chose specifically to put it here for two reasons. The belly dancer in a scene that went on too long for no reason. Yeah. And the women fighting each other scene for the same reason. Mm. The same non-reason. The belly dancer's bad, but I'll take it over the two women fighting. That's yeah. just so sleazy and gross. Well, it, what was, I like the ADR cat noises. Yeah. <laughs> the worst part of that wasn't that they were fighting over the same guy or that somebody was going to choose who the winner of the guy was. It was that they both got given... To James Bond. They they didn't even get to, you know, win the man they were fighting over. No, here, James Bond. And one night with him, and all of a sudden, yeah, we don't yeah, need him anymore. Exactly. <laughs> for me, it's the fact that when they're fighting, you see all these people watching, and it really feels like it's a show for them. It is. Mm. It's yeah. really... The, it, it's set up as entertainment. Yeah, where at least with the belly dancer, when she's doing it, you see other women watching, and they're cool with it, and she's cool with it, and everybody's having fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's got some problems, but I can take that a little easier than that whole thing. And... It just it doesn't move the story forward at all. You could just chop Neither it right out. Neither does the belly dancing. Yeah, they could have picked one though. It's yeah. it's like the belly dancing thing is it's it's almost yeah. like part of the travel log thing. It's part yeah, of the it's, culture. It's, today they would have the belly dancer, but like she would be backgrounded. Like we'd see a, we'd see a couple right. close ups, and she'd be in the background. Whereas this one, the pitch of this is, hey, Mister and Mrs. Nineteen Sixty Four audience, you may never have seen an actual belly dancer before. So you know. Here you go. Now you don't have to actually travel to Istanbul or uh, wherever you think you're going to find. Are, are there really Romani traveling camps in Istanbul? I'm asking sincerely. I have no I idea. Don't, I was wondering like, the same thing. I have no idea. Because, I mean, the, Istanbul is pretty fucking far from Romania Rome, and, 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 and yeah. uh, you know, other I mean, it's not even near Italy. And then, like, the, the lead guy is there who's exactly that guy. I mean, he looks like he's, you know, he's taking some time off from tormenting Pinocchio. <laughs> And they have the stereotypical carts. Yeah, right. Yeah. The, the, covered the low wagon. covered wagons, yeah. Mm. So that's travel by land, and that would be through Russia, through yeah. a lot of places. So that would be a, a very far-ranging... Yeah, I mean, travelers travel, but, I mean, that's a long way yeah. to go through occupied territory where there's communist dictatorships with nothing to sell them. Another thing that threw me off is that Bond is speaking to them in their language at one point. He thanks the woman who brings him his little seat cushion. When the head of the camp has this long speech about how he's welcome, he says, uh, uh, tell him I'm very honored. And then the guy responds in English, thank you. I want him to say, thank you. I speak English, dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> Or the fact in that fight, he's kind of pushing over the Romani and the agents kind of willy-nilly. Just like, two of them here, I'll throw this into both of them. There, they'll sort it out. Fine. Plus, yeah. I mean, he's coming into the situation and all of a sudden shots ring out and he's up with his gun and he's just shooting. It's like, who are you shooting at? <laughs> do, do you know what this fight is about? He's just participating because he's there. He's gonna get to, uh, oh, wait, that's for me. Yeah. <laughs> It's a silly scene. It's a very it's, silly scene. It's, it's a, wait, the low a, point of the film for me. Wait, there's another one with a with Romani camp, right? There, there's a, it, there's a, it's one of the the, the Dalton ones, right? Um, Living Daylights, maybe. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, because License get to, to Kill look is all to another one of these drug dealers. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that was <laughs> another that, Romani scene. Well, that one's even worse though, I th as as I recall, because it's much much more recent, so it's much much less okay. <laughs> uh. As for some of the other uh, edits they had to cut, you notice how in the last scene when he's looking at the film and says, yes. Grant was right, and all of a sudden there's this weird music cut and he just throws it overboard. They had to cut out a moment on the train scene where Robert Shaw's talking about going, yeah, what a performance, Mr. Bond. And Bond would have said that line again, was a, quite a performance before he throws it out. For some reason, that had to be cut out. Hmm. Probably the idea of it being a performance. Like a porn, basically. I guess, but the the British censors on all of these, I recall, were really weird about acknowledging that Bond was having sex with anybody. We we know what he's doing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think we actually see him in the middle of having sex with anyone until Die Another Day. No, no. It's no. always like just before or just after. Tasteful fade out. You also notice when Cleb dies that her scream kind of gets cut off in a weird way. They decided they had to cut out it her scream. It was so terrible. Was kinda, I ah! noticed that it was like ah. Silence, her mouth is gaping as she's just kind of sliding down the wall. It was very awkward. Yeah. She had apparently had this agonized scream, and that was a little too much for them. Uh, they also had to cut one scene due to a continuity error. Era. Era. Um, there was chowder. A... <laughs> Say chowder. Chowder. 
There was a scene where Bond stages a car accident with a taxi to get away from that Bulgarian agent that's following them. But that scene would have occurred after Robert Shaw kills him in the church. And nobody <laughs> noticed that they showed to preview audiences and then one of the it's producers one of the producer's sons is like, Didn't that guy already die a couple scenes ago? And they had to cut it out really quickly. One thing with the editing, editor Peter Hunt actually changed the shape of Bond films with this one. Originally, it was going to open with the normal title sequence, Mm. and then that first training scene where Grant kills Bond, and he thought, wouldn't it be more interesting to switch this around and have this before the credits? So basically invented Mm. the pre-title action scene for these movies. Nice. All right. That's my man. Yeah, and they've kept doing it ever since then. Those are good even in the bad ones. It is a really good one to start with Bond being stalked by somebody. Oh, oh, Bond's dead. Oh, all right. Well, that's it. Credits. (laughs) I had my hopes up. (laughs) Uh, As a joke, when he was showing the rough cut of the movie to uh, director Terrence Young, uh, Hunt actually cut the scene where Q's showing the case to Bond to like, turn these and open it and the tear gas bomb won't go off. You try it. So he cut it so that Bond opens it up and cut to the explosion of the headquarters from Dr. No and then put credits at the end of it and present it. (laughs) There's your movie. Best movie ever. And Young thought it was great. He grabbed it and showed it to uh, all the United Artists executives going, here's the movie. What do you think, guys? Nice. Uh, we also get the first official James Bond song with From Russia With Love, sung by Matt Monroe and written by Lionel Bart, the guy who composed Oliver. So we hear that song twice and we get the title written on a photograph. So we're getting beaten over the head with this title. I love the fact that it's playing on the radio when Bond is with Sylvia yeah. Trench. I can just hear him like, hmm, that might be important later. It's kind of a kind of a lackluster song. It's just this mm. romantic ballad. It doesn't have the energy that the later Bond songs will have. Mm. I think once the Bond songs became an institution, there was a lot more riding on it being a good song. Well, it's, I mean, the first one, the closest thing we get for, to a Bond song is Three Blind Mice. Oh, and that Underneath the Mango Tree one oh, yes, they kept I playing over about that and over. Mm-hmm. Uh, we won't really get the real James Bond song until the next movie with Goldfinger by mm-hmm. Shirley Bassey. All the triggers are ready to fire for Goldfinger in this one. You can just see it a little bit. It's like, we're almost there. We're almost there. We've almost got this locked in and figured out. Yeah, that's another one that's a little more between that. It's a little more ridiculous. You have the over-the-top mm-hmm. villain, but they still haven't gotten into, okay, here's the bad guy layer. Here's the standard good girl, bad girl dynamic that mm-hmm. they do later on. The formula's still a little loose, which is another reason that's another better one. You know, hand to hand of that one isn't bad either. With odd job, it's not as good as this one. It's, but, a, it's uh, a pretty toward, good fight. Towards scene. the end, it's pretty good. Yeah, the, the one we fights the guy in the dress is is the, my favorite hand to hand fight in any of these. Oh, from uh, Thunderball. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that is awesome. that is a, that awesome. is a funny fight. That's a good that's fight. Awesome. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't get Maurice Binder doing the titles. We got Robert Brown John who does the projecting it on the belly dancer thing. Yeah, that was pretty awful. <laughs> Which was probably wow, that's amazing for its day, but now it looks pretty silly. Apparently inspired by his wife walking in front of a slide projector and an image appearing across her body. Is that also how we ended up with the belly dancer scene? Oh, we've got to put this in here somewhere. And the producer's like, put, put my name on her boobs. They do it better in Goldfinger. Mm. It works a lot better in that one because it's a woman sprayed gold so and she's the projection screen. It just it's, plays a little better in that one. And yep. it all leads up to Spectre and the octopus <laughs> Oh, God. It must have been electric in the screening room when they first showed this to like all these like older executives watching. Like, okay, title scenes. This is always the least interesting part of the movie. Here we go, Dixon. Wait a minute. Holy shit! I'm someone's actually... <laughs> someone's a genius. Why didn't we think of this before? Why hasn't this been every movie? Can we project the whole thing like this? My God. <laughs> It'll be like a William Castle technique. They'll have a screen which is women just standing there like this. I've heard worse ideas. <laughs> smell o vision Oh, now, now, now you're just being unpleasant. Speaking of unpleasant, I <laughs> always forget about the scene where Bond slaps Tatiana in the train. Yeah, that was yeah. great. Now I want the truth. James, you're hurting I'll me. I'll do worse than that if you don't tell me. You're doing this under orders, I know. What are they? I don't know what you mean. Liar. <laughs> Even if you kill me, I can say nothing. They try to play it off as, okay, now he thinks she's an enemy agent and Karen Bay just got killed and she's been deceiving him. But when you remember those quotes that Connery had about slapping women when they need it, it's just mm-hmm. like, oh. Especially because then he goes right back to, oh, you can trust me. And Mr. Playing the Lover mm-hmm. again. This, is this our first slap of the series here? This uh, one, because that comes back a lot. He flings around Miss Taro in Dr. No, I think, a little bit. Well, not when he's fighting like the bad women. There's usually at least one. Settle down. What's wrong with you? Come to your senses. Whack! In in, in one of these. I'm pretty sure yeah. the Bond girl in the last movie, I don't recall what her name was, she was relatively self-sufficient, so mm, I, don't, yeah. I don't think 
I don't remember that I, she was. I don't hit. think so. I know in the next yeah. one he spanks one girl to be like, "Man, talk, go away," and spanks her out of the scene. But yeah, yeah that's like the white by Felicia. As to some trivia for the movie, the book was actually one of John F. Kennedy's favorites, and this movie was the last movie Kennedy saw before his assassination. He screened it in the White House before he took off for Dallas. Ouch. Yeah, pretty grim. It's not the last movie I would want to see. Mm. Uh, the opening scene had to be reshot because the actor playing the Bond double, they had to give him a mustache because when they first shot it, they peeled the mask off and the guy actually looked a lot like Sean Connery and the <laughs> audience would have been confused. The sound that that mask made when they peeled it off the live target's face, it was mm. so gross. I was just... <sighs> I do love so gross. that the makeup on Connery for that whole scene is weird to make him look kind of plasticky and strange. Yeah. The color of his yeah. skin isn't quite right. It's a nice subtle detail. That tiny little collapsible rifle that Bond has isn't actually just one of the series gadgets. It's actually a real rifle by the Henry Repeating Firearms Company. It's actually light enough to float in water, which hmm. is kind of neat. Like the rats? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> There's there that- were floating rats. I mean, they, they were supposed to be rats swimming in the water, and they were very obviously toy rats just floating on the surface. <laughs> so awkward. It was mm. so bad. Uh, apparently that scene where the rats are all running all over the place, they tried to film it with lab rats that were white, so they coated them with chocolate, but the rats just stopped and started licking each other and licking themselves. And Because it's very chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the best gig we've ever had. I like this movie business. There are no pleasant behind-the-scenes animal stories before, like, 1980. They're all they're all bad. There's not one behind the scenes. Here's how we did this with animal stuff in any of these movies. That's not a fucking horror show. I was getting uncomfortable with the Siamese fighting fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that <laughs> that really upset me. Even though I mean I know that's what they do, but they're being put in that situation to yeah. perform that act, and they're killing each other. And it was it was I don't need to see yeah. that. It doesn't need to happen. Yeah. yeah, and they're dying for a really strained metaphor. They're, they're <laughs> no. dying for the worst movie. <laughs> this is this is nice, Blofeld, but you know, like a chalk drawing would handle this. Yeah, and it wasn't it like the survivor was fed live to the cat. I did like how the cat's like, "Oh, give me that, give me that. I'll take that." Yeah. Other <laughs> so, suddenly, the cat's okay with being there. I like when you see these in HD now, and you can tell that you know, like, like the signature thing is like you know the perfect white cat, and it's like, wow, somebody needs to wash that cat. I like when you see it in uh, You Only Live Twice and that cat really does not like Donald Pleasant. No, that loud noise goes off and the cat's like, ah, oh, fuck this. Yeah. <laughs> the first scene between Bond and Romanova in the hotel room actually became the go-to audition scene when they're trying out new actors for the Bond role. That's roles. gross. You can actually see them in mm. some of the uh, DVD extras for later on when they cast Dalton and um, I think Roger Moore. That's a little over the line. How do these women look like in bed? Like, what, what do they look like? <laughs> well, at least in the other ones, they're actually not in bed. They're just sitting on a bed, and they're just reciting the dialogue. Yeah. The scene where Bond and Karen Bay assassinate the Bulgarian agent, the movie that's being advertised on the billboard is Call Me Buana from the same producers, Albert Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, who did this series. And for a photo shoot for the film, Connery posed with this large Walther air pistol because they couldn't find the Walther PBK, and that became that famous image of him with this ridiculous oversized gun crossed in front of his chest. Huh. Because I always wondered, why do they always show him with that gun? He never uses that gun in the movies. Mm. That's why. This is actually considered one of the best Bond films. It's supposedly the favorite Bond film of both Timothy Dalton and Daniel Craig, which I think is interesting. I can actually kind of understand it with Daniel Craig. A little bit. Because yeah. I don't think he gets into the yeah. cartoony, crazy Bond as much as some of the other actors might have. Like it's Roger not Moore. encouraging that they're calling this their favorite. What do they think was the worst one? Like, what one do I have to be the most leery of? I'd say either Moonraker, which you've already We've been seen through, Moonraker. Or, that um, was abysmal. Live and Let Die is really bad. Yeah, Live and Let Die is not good. Uh, great song. Seems like it should be good. Opens great. You've got Yafet Koto as yeah. the bad guy. Awesome. And they managed to screw it up. I don't know if it's the worst. It's definitely the most unpleasant. Yes. Yeah, um, live, live, live and Let Die is really hard to get through. View to a Kill would be up there for worse, too, I think. Oh, View to a Kill is fun. Yeah, it was fun when it was called Goldfinger. Yeah, okay, it's just Goldfinger again, but, you know, it's got an interesting henchwoman. Walken does okay. Walken does fine, but it's a boring character. Is that the one with Grace Jones? It's, yeah, that, she's the yeah. other great villain. Those actors are fun, but the parts they're playing are terrible. Seeing Roger Moore romance Tanya Roberts is just plain creepy and unpleasant. Yeah, yeah. Especially by that point where he's essentially a mummy. It's yeah. I'm sorry. It's a mean thing to say, and sometimes the truth hurts. One other interesting thing about this one: that shot of the helicopter exploding was reused for two Doctor Who serials. It oh, was yeah? in um, Enemy of the World with Patrick Troughton and The Damons with John Pertwee, who was sort of the James Bond version of the Doctor. Hmm. So it's funny. Every time I see it, all I can think of is those two, and it, that it should be in black and white because that's how I first saw it in Enemy <laughs> of the World. 
And the film later inspired a PlayStation 2 game where Sean Connery came back to voice Bond again. It's the last time he's played the character to this point. It was just a PS2 really? direct translation of it. They had to change some things around because they were still in, stuck with the rights issues involving Spectre. So they had to change it to this evil organization called Octopus. But pretty much the plot. Mm. Nice. And substantially more action and shooting than, than is in the film. Yeah, they, they actually take the uh, jetpack scene from yeah, Thunderball and yeah. wedge it in there and a few other bits. Oh. <laughs> if it had been a better game, they could have made a whole series of those. Yeah, I know, yeah. yeah. I mean, what else was Connery doing at that point? Not much, yeah. not much. Uh, all right, what's everybody's favorite scene? The movie ended. <laughs> See, I figured yours would be the pre-title sequence. The pre-title sequence was fun. Um most pre-title sequences are fun. Unfortunately, it has the very bad position of being first in the movie, which means I have like an hour and a half more to watch. So it <laughs> fills me with dread. I I just don't like these movies. Gosh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of like a sincere one that I like that's not like sort of ironic appreciation. You know, because normally, like, the girl fight thing is so ridiculous, I would say it's like, yes, this is the entertaining reason to watch movies. Like, holy shit, at one point, this was completely cool to wedge into the into the movie. Just watch how silly this is. You know, I'm a big fan of... Is this our first walk through a training camp in one of these? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so this is the, the beginning of that, right? Because, like, every Bond movie did this, and then Enter the Dragon did it, and then, like, every action movie has had the... Just have a bunch of guys doing random shit in the background while we do, like, the Sorkin walk. You know, through this, and some guys back there with a flamethrower through the training area i hope our work here meets with your approval training is useful but there is no substitute for experience i agree we use life targets as well It looked like a carnival shooting target. It's like, yes, this is exactly what a lethal terrorist training camp on Spectre Island looks like. I love that bit with the flamethrower. You see they're testing it, and some poor Schmo is running out of the yeah, way and leaping for cover. Yeah. They never find us on Spectre Island. So long as you don't call it that on the map or something, you know. Especially because it seems to be pretty large. It's it's not like a little speck in the middle of like the ocean or something. It's like, it's like the size know. of Madagascar. Wolfeld yeah. steps out. Who ordered the Amazon delivery address to Spectre Island again? <laughs> <laughs> I do not want to have to move the headquarters again. I had to kill three DHL guys this week. <laughs> For me, it has to be the Bond-Grant confrontation on the train. Yeah, the, that's a good one. The verbal sparring and the fight after. I do mm. really love mm. that fight scene. Yeah. Especially because you can see it's actually the two actors doing most of it. There's yeah. enough shots of them in their close-ups so you can see the faces that it's really them. And it really looks like they're trying to hurt each other. Any more in the other case? I should imagine so. It's a standard kit. I'll have a look. Put your hands back in your pockets. Keep them there. I wish, though, for that scene, because it was fun, but I wish we hadn't had so many scenes of James Bond opening up that case. I would have rather forgotten a little bit that it was a trap. It doesn't help that every time you open up the case, one of us would be like, boom! I know. <laughs> <laughs> End of the movie. Bond is forgetful, and just the one time he forgets to turn that little latch. Yeah, or, you know, they have a porter who happens to be a little snoopy. Mm -hmm. All right, what's everybody's recommendations if you didn't like it, which... Okay. <laughs> what do you think somebody might like instead? I guess it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for a spy movie, I'm still going to go to Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. If you're looking for an adventure travel movie, just go right for Indiana Jones. Skip right over Bond. Ah, gosh, you know, I I, uh, I don't think Thunderball gets as much love. I don't I don't think I think Thunderball is really underrated. It's a bit Bond slow, but it's very pretty and yeah. all the scuba scenes are really good. Yeah. Uh, my favorite Bond is You Only Live Twice, but I don't know if I can in good conscience actually recommend that to people anymore. <laughs> That's another one you need, like, really, it's like, now, okay, you're going to see some stuff that is uh, just not okay anymore, yeah. but really, the rest of it's good. The Willy Wonka guy wrote it. It's nuts. <laughs> um, for me, too, I think of... One that's kind of similar plot-wise, but totally different in tone is Sneakers. This idea oh, yeah. of people trying to manipulate movie. somebody into stealing this decoder thing. That movie is so much fun. Mm, it's it really great stuff. It's a, a light-hearted, goofy kind of take on the spy movie. I just really enjoy those. Mm. 
And in terms of that whole spy idea of getting this beautiful female agent who seduces somebody to get the job done, I go back to Notorious, the Hitchcock. Yeah. And these movies steal a lot from Hitchcock. I mean, mm-hmm. you can see it with the North by Northwest crop duster, in this case, helicopter chase. Yeah. And in that one, you have that same sort of plot with Ingrid Bergman forced to do that for Cary Grant's Smooth Spy, but it actually deals with some of the consequences, the emotional consequences of it, and how unfair it is to her and how horrible the situation that she's put into is. Mm. So I'd go with that one. All right, anything else to say about From Russia With Love? Nope. I'm pretty good. Could you fetch my shirt, please? <laughs> okay, so we've already had to fetch shoes and now shirts. Is it going to be underwear, socks? I think he does a couple in this one. Shirt fetch and like, tie. could you hand me that? Or Yeah. yeah. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. All right, that ends our conversation, but not the discussion. If you'd like to have your say about From Russia with Love or feel that we missed something, check out the comments section for this episode on cinemaspection.com and start talking. Email your comments, complaints, questions, and suggestions to cinemaspection at gmail.com. You can also like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. Our show is available on iTunes and Stitcher, and if you like what you hear, please subscribe to us, and if you have a moment to spare, please leave us a review there. We appreciate any feedback you can offer. We'll be back to discuss another movie next time. Until then, thanks for listening, and remember to keep watching closely. There's more to a movie than just what's on the screen. Shoot, did you do Thunderball yet? That has, you know... No, the... no, not yet. Oh, no, that, that has we scuba did, diving. We That's did awesome. Dr. No. We did Dr. Oh, no. Right. And yeah. I hated it so much. <laughs> and this one, I still hate... I mean, it wasn't as aggressively bad, so I will give you that. It, uh, but it still sucks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you heard it here first. That's going on the movie poster. <laughs> For much more not, love, it still sucks. <laughs> not as bad as the first one.